Um, all right, uh, welcome everyone to our next uh, Geophysics and Tectonics seminar. Uh, I'm happy to, pronounce, uh, to announce our speaker this week uh, is Ming Ming Li from the University of, or uh, sorry, Arizona State University. Um, we'll be talking about um, thermal anomalies um, in cold subduction influence regions of the lowermost mantle. So we'll be going deep inside the earth uh, today. So thank you, Ming Ming, for joining us and whenever you're ready. Thank you, Kelly, for the introduction, and uh, thanks to all, everyone for coming to this seminar. Uh, uh, today, I'm going to talk about some of my recent work on studying the formation of hot thermal anomalies in the relatively cold subduction influence regions of Earth's lowermost mantle. Uh, let me advance. So, this slide shows a global seismic shear wave tomography model and uh, uh, the red color represents lower than average seismic velocity, and the blue color is higher than average seismic velocity. The most important feature in this, in this figure is there are two large low shear velocity provinces, or LSVPs, and the one beneath the Central Pacific and the, the other beneath Africa. And also surrounding the LSVPs are regions with blue color representing, usually, uh, are interpreted as uh, subducted slabs, which are rel relatively colder than the LSVPs. So this is a lar large scale feature of the lowermost mantle. And uh, in this slide, this figure shows the seismic tomography model uh, by French and Romanovich uh, near the common boundary at 2,800 kilometers depth. And again, red color is low and uh, Blue color is high seismic velocity, and uh, particularly I I use these uh, black color outlines the locations of the LSVP to LSVPs. And uh, what I want to talk about is not the LSVPs, but the regions outside the LSVPs, and uh, which are interpreted to be uh, regions uh, with subducted slabs. So one interesting feature in these regions outside the LSVPs is that you see lots of small, uh, relatively small structures with low velocities as well, and uh, they are almost everywhere, lots of them here. So this is just one of the seismic tomography model global. And in this slide, I show you about 12, no, about 15 uh, global seismic shear wave, shear wave tomography models. And uh, at also, all of them are at the same depth near the common boundary. So the one common feature, so first of all, there are, uh, the large scale structure is consistent, but in terms of the small scale structure, they, they can be different uh, uh, model by model. However, one common thing in these models is that all of them have uh, quite some uh, low velocity structures outside the to large low shear velocity provinces. Like, like, like even this, this one, the, this tomography model with the longest wavelength, they also have some uh, low velocity structure outside the, uh, outside the large low shear velocity provinces. And this is very interesting. And uh, not only just global seismic tomography models, people have also tried to um, understand the structure outside LSVPs using a uh, relatively high resolution uh, for seismic forward modeling. So this is, uh, and uh, next I'm going to show you some of the most recent studies of, of the low velocity structures outside LSVPs based on seismic waveform modeling. And this is one of them, and by soon at all at, in 2013, and they found uh, low seismic velocities with this like a uh, rolling structure or ridge structure in Central America. And this one is by her at all in 2014. And uh, in this figure A, the red color shows the uh, sample regions near the common boundary. And they also found low velocity structures like, like in, in this plot beneath Northwest Pacific. And uh, this is another one by Suzuki at all, 2016. They also found quite some low velocity structures like in, in this figure is at about like, 50 kilometers above the common boundary. Now you see these regions in, are in the North Pacific, 
which is usually a loss of subduction happens, but they also found low velocity structures in these regions. And this is another one by uh, Borgia et al, 2017. And again, they also found quite some uh, uh, small low velocity structures uh, beneath Central America, which should be loss of subduction happening there. And uh, another really recent one is by Nelson and Grant, the 2018. They actually did a regional seismic tomography models and they found that beneath the yellow storm, they the uh, really hot, relatively hot region and maybe uh, low velocity structures just extending from the common boundary to almost near the surface. So this is another really, really interesting study showing there are low velocity structures in subduction regions. And uh, this, in this figure, uh, the background color, the pink color shows the two large low shear velocity provinces and the red color, the red, red patches show the locations of the ultra low velocity zones. So the ultra low velocity zones are how seismic velocity is really significant reduction of seismic velocity, usually up to 10% for a P wave velocity and uh, about 30% for S wave velocity. So now if you look at this map, they are almost, you with this or ultra low velocity zones almost everywhere. But, and an interesting finding is that they are quite some uh, UOVZs outside the two LSVPs and they have very low seismic velocity structures. So not all, and uh, here's another interesting finding by Frost et al. They uh, imaging the seismic scatters in the low most 300 kilometers of the Earth's mantle and uh, they found that they are actually lots of seismic scatters in these uh, relatively cold regions outside the two LSVPs. So like uh, can, in combining the results that I just uh, talked about just, just now, and this figure combines all these results, like the background shows the seismic tomography model by French and Romanomics 2014 and 2015, and the bright color co outlines the two LSVPs. And uh, here, the red color, red contour shows the low velocity structures uh, observed by, based on seismic forward modeling. And the dots shows the seismic scatters. And the cyan color shows the locations of, of your VZs outside the uh, LSVPs. So the message I want to convey here is that the, uh, there are very wide spread low velocity structures outside the two large low shear velocity provinces. And this is interesting. And the next I'm going to move you towards the top. Like in this figure, the background still shows the seismic, seismic tomography model near the command boundary and there are two LSVPs. And the uh, uh, very important finding of is showing in this figure is that like the green circle shows the locations of the initial eruption site of large igneous province and the yellow circles with stars show the active hotspots with deep plumes and the dots or shows the location of Kimbrice. So one important conclusion from this figure is that uh, if we think the large low shear real, uh, if we think the large igneous provinces and hotspots are caused by mantle plumes, we can see uh, most of these uh, rips or hotspots occur at the edges or inside the or above the top of the two LSVPs, and they are very interesting. Uh, there are not many mantle plumes occurring outside the two LSVPs, although previously I said that there are lots of low velocity structures outside the LSVP. So this is really, this is really interesting. So then the question is what causes the low velocity structure outside the LSVPs in, in the low most mantle because this, this region should be strongly influenced by cold subductive slabs, right? So they, uh, like, until they, they have been many two options. One, option one is about compositional heterogeneity. 
So most people in previous studies interpret as a composition of heterogeneity, like for example, the subtracted ocean in cross. And the other uh, interpretation is they are caused by hot thermal anomalies. And uh, today I'm going to mainly focus on this possibility. Like I try to explore the mechanism to cause hot thermal anomalies in these subduction influenced regions. So first of all, the hot thermal anomaly uh, developed as a result of thermal boundary layer instability. So the common boundary is a really important thermal boundary layer because it is heated by the Earth's core. So in this figure from top to bottom shows the gradual growth of a uh, thermal boundary layer and then the thermal boundary layer eventually becomes unstable and the amount of prunes form uh, from the thermal boundary layer. And uh, uh, this figure shows a tank experiment and uh, the black color shows the rising, th rising thermal plumes uh, inside a tank of water. So now if you look at this uh, rising thermal plumes, they almost have even space, right? Usually people found that without being strongly influenced by external amount of flows, like the thermal instabilities would be nearly evenly spaced and the number of these plumes is uh, controlled by the, is mainly controlled by the viscosity. And uh, however, for the Earth, it's very different. Like, for, like the locations of the thermal instabilities are greatly controlled by the subduction of slabs to the lowermost mantle. And the this is because the subduction of slabs controls the uh, major uh, forces of mantle convection and it also greatly influenced mantle flow field in the lowermost mantle. Like in this in this figure, the uh, blue color shows the location shows shows a subductive slab and the red color shows the temperature temperature field and here is mantle plume. Like the greens, the green line sh sh outlines the top of the thermal boundary layer. So we we see that the thermal boundary layer is thinnest beneath just beneath the slab and it, in, it becomes thicker and thicker in, in the direction of mantle flow, then it eventually becomes unstable. And usually, a uh, previous idea is that usually mantle plumes forms outside, just make outside and maybe right at edges of the slabs because the stone rolling slab material pushes a material out uh, aside and then eventually form into mantle plumes. So this figure shows the previous seismic uh, uh, previous geodynamic model results by Tan at all 2012. And the, the figure on the top shows a blue subducted slab reaching the mid low mantle. And the, the button shows the thermal anomaly start to develop. And the, in the figure at the button, you will see a mantle plume rises from the common boundary to beneath the surface. And the mantle plume occurs right at the edges, right outside of the subtactic slabs. And the reason is because the location of thermal anomalies are like controlled by the uh, subtactic slabs. And, the, and the, there are also lots of other studies. And the, uh, before and uh, the main conclusion of these studies, like plume form in regions with usually plume form in regions with convergent flows. Like if you sh look at in this figure, uh, this is a figure from uh, the paper by Zoom at all, uh, 2000, 2000, like 20 years ago. Uh, the yellow color shows rising mantle plume and the blue color shows subduct slabs. So if you look at this figure, you, you will notice that the plume usually forms in regions like between the subduct slabs. And uh, they, they found that plumes preferentially form in regions with convergent mantle flows or they call is the stagnant points. And the like similar features have been found by many, many other studies. And this is one, uh, uh, one of them, and the by Davis 2005, like in these regions are subducted regions and outside the subducted regions, the hot material are being pushed into linear ridges. And usually mantle plumes formed above when the two or, more, two or three linear ridge thermal ridges uh, merge together, mantle plumes form in these intersections. And this is another one. They show mantle plumes form in regions of its convergent mantle flows. 
and this is another one by Roman 2000, at all 2004, and this is relatively more recent one 10 years ago, or still by Bull at all, and this is another one by Labros 2002. So like, uh, uh, let, let me uh, give a very brief summary of what I just said uh, now. So first of all, uh, the seismic observations have shown low velocity structures outside the LSVPs. And we also know that the thermal boundary layer grows this time and eventually becomes unstable. And the people have done lots of uh, geodynamic modeling and also tank experiments try to understand the development, the develop development of uh, thermal instabilities. And they, the, one of the main conclusion is that mantle plumes form in regions with convergent flows due to the spreading of subduct slabs in the lowermost mantle. So this point is very important and it points and it is related to a very important feature, which is the subducted slabs. So in order to better understand the mechanism for the formation of host thermal anomaly, let's first uh, do, let's first examine the features of the subducted slabs because it's so important. So this figure shows a cartoon figure of the subducted slabs. So the slab subducted and uh, it, which, and the slab has a wall-like structure. And uh, usually it, uh, in cartoons, you see a slab like this. And also in 2D uh, convection models, the slab have a sheet like or wall-like structure. However, in reality, the slab may is much more complex, like in, as shown in this figure, the blue color shows outlines the stuff up the high high seismic velocity uh, structures and the, like representing the subduct slabs beneath the uh, America. Like uh, this, you, you can see like very often the thickness of slab varies from place to place and very often there are holes or gaps between the slabs right and uh, next i'm going to show you lots of other studies like by by harris at all 2018 they found gaps uh, in subduct between subducted slabs and this is even more complex subducted slabs as shown by sigroch and 2008 and uh, this is another one by Portner and uh, Hayes, uh, 2018. They found a gap between subducted slabs. And this is a more recent one by Joe, uh, 2018, like beneath North America, the furlong uh, slab, there is a hole in, in the slab. So what I, and also not just, not only the subducted slab in the deep mantle, and people have also found the, uh, uh, seismic heterogeneities within the oceanic plate, like near the top. And uh, in, this, in this slide, the figure on the left shows the seismic tomography model by French et al. 2013. And uh, near the, of the Pacific, oh, Pacific, Pacific plate, and, uh, and this uh, two figure, figure B and figure C show the vertical cross sections in this in these two regions, like one and the two regions. Now you can see that they actually observe uh, quite some seismic heterogeneities within the uh, within the oceanic plate. So not only the uh, subduct slabs in the deep mantle is complex, but also the subduct slabs itself they have really complex even on near the top surface, and they have been an idea very, very long time ago in, in, in the community, which is about sub, sub lithosphere small scale convection, or, or people call it Richter Ross. Like in this figure, uh, people show a 3D uh, geodynamic mo modeling uh, convection models. And uh, they found that usually at some edges uh, beneath the lithosphere, as the, lithos the base of the lithosphere eventually becomes unstable and they forms like this uh, almost pa pa nearly parallel structures uh, and uh, extending in the same direction of plate motion and uh, these are kind of really close and uh, they, they, these two figures are also 3D uh, geodynamic modeling results showing the 
development of thermal instabilities beneath the uh, lithosphere, which usually people explain it by sub lithosphere small scale connection. So now there are a lot. There are lots of remaining questions, and the two of them is that, and the, the one of the question is, what mechanism can cause hot thermal anomalies, but not necessarily upwelling mantle clones in cold subductive inference regions outside LSVPs, and the, is that also caused by small scale connection, like similar to the sub sphere connection, and the, this is quite interesting. And again, I want to remind you that. We observe lots of low velocity structures in, near the command boundary, but we don't observe many mandal plumes outside the two LSVPs. Right? This is really interesting. And then we try to answer what mechanism can cause this observation. And the other question I try to answer is how does the thermal structure of the subducted slabs affect the formation of these hot thermal anomalies? Because I, I have shown you that. It's the morphology of the subducted slabs is quite complex, and there are also thermal heterogeneities, maybe within or associate or near the subducted slabs. So to answer these two questions, my uh, we do a geodynamic modeling, and the concept of geodynamic modeling is uh, pretty simple. So we think the deep physical process are controlled by some fundamental physical laws like Newton's laws, like, and the, the three most important of these laws are like conservation of mass, mass is conserved, and also conservation of mo momentum like force balance, uh, force needs to be balanced, and conservation of energy, like energy should be conserved. And uh, I'm not going to talk about the equations right now. And uh, so, and uh, we need to choose a mo model domain in our geodynamic modeling. So, like uh, in this study, we we use a partial 3D spherical uh, model domain, like as shown in in this figure, the a uh, brown color representing our model domain. So, as you can see, it's not global sphere, but it's partial spherical sphere, and uh, on the figure on the right, then we are view, view, view this model domain from top to the button, like from the top surface and the, to the button near the common boundary. And the size of the model domain is uh, 112 degree times 112 degree in longitude and latitude direction, and also this whole mantle depth. And in addition to this, large box models, we also did quite some lots of seismic and uh, lots of geodynamic models using these relatively small regions like I shown in this orange color. Like in this small box models, the size is 40 degree by 40 degree and we only un try to simulate the dynamics in the low most 300 kilometers depth. The good thing of this small box model is that it can allow you have very, very high resolution. Then you can examine in very details about what was happening in that, in that depth, right? And uh, here are some details of the model setup. Like we use the most approximation in most models, but in some models, we also can see the latent heating and viscous heating, adiabatic heating using the extended post approximation in, in some of our models. And there are two types of models, like the large box model, which covers the whole mantle depths, are showing by this gray color, and also the small box models, and uh, which is the low most. Uh, 300 kilometers. It, it has really high resolution, like several kilometers of resolution. And uh, for large box models, it's free sleep on all boundaries for large box models. So that means we did not impose anything. Uh, the um, connection just developed by itself due to the uh, depending on the system. And the, the viscosity is temperature dependent, high degree of temperature dependent viscosity, and they are also depth dependent. The upper mantle is uh, about 30 or 50 uh, times lower viscosity than the lower mantle. And we also consider the post pearl sky phase transition. And in some cases, the post pearl sky has uh, much lower viscosity than the surrounding mantle. And we also 
we perform both purely thermal and thermal chemical calculations. And the code we use is the SIGCON CEO code, which is open source on the CIG website. So it's free, don't download it from CIG. And let me first show you uh, the first model. So you, in this model, it's a large box model, and the, the black color outlines the model domain in this model, and the uh, yellow color shows uh, in initial global layer of intrinsically dense material, and uh, we use it to simulate uh, the LSVP. So because people usually sometimes think the LSVP are caused by intrinsically dense compositional distinct materials. So let's run the movie. So some crazy things happening at the beginning because it's initial condition effects, but let's look at movie and running for a while. Let me stop, pause here for a while to explain what you are seeing in uh, right now. So, and uh, there are se several important features you are seeing the most, the, wow, in the center, the green color represents the thermal chemical pie, which is uh, intrinsically dense than the surrounding mantle. And the uh, gray color uh, shows the locations of mantle plumes. So you can see most of these mantle plumes form at edges of the thermal chemical pile, but some mantle plumes form in, in, in the center of the thermal chemical pile. And uh, at the north and the south boundary, the sign and the contour shows the locations of the cold dome whirlings, and the cold dome whirlings sinking from the top surface to near the common boundary. And the, in, in this movie, we also show the temperature field near the common boundary, or uh, specifically at about at uh, 45 kilometers above the common boundary. So now let's continue uh, the movie. And again, and also the arrows show the amount of flow velocity field near the common boundary. Let's continue this movie. Now you can see the cold dome whirlings, they start to migrate from north south to the west side, side boundary. And again, in all through, throughout calculation, mantle plumes forming at edges of the thermal chemical pile. And the thermal chemical pile, they just passively pushed aside by the cold down volumes. And, the, and the, what's very interesting is like here, and the, after cold down volumes migrate to the west side boundary, like outside the thermal chemical piles, is, these regions are the lake, relatively cold, but very interestingly, we also see lots of hot thermal anomalies in these cold, relatively cold subduction influence regions, right? And they have linear like structure and they're extending in the same direction as mantle flows and they connect to the thermal, connect to the edges of thermal chemical pi and the mantle plumes forms at edges of the thermal chemical pi and uh, we can, oh, let's, and the, this slide shows some snapshots of the movie you just saw just now. And the, uh, like figure A is at, at earlier stage, then figure B at a later stage. And what's more interesting is showing in figure C. Like in figure C, you see the thermal chemical pile have been uh, pushed to the west to the eastern part of the model domain and the outside the pipe, there are lots of some anomalies in the subducting influence regions. And uh, also uh, in this figure D, uh, we show the 3D morphology of these uh, hot thermal anomalies. Now you can see this, the thermal anomalies, they, the thickness increases uh, along the amount of flow velocities, right? They are thickest near the edges of the thermal chemical pile and the thinness just, just near the, towards the subducted slabs and the amount of plumes uh, start to develop at, at edges of the thermal chemical pile. And uh, because, because of the shape of this, and uh, I'm, going, I, I'm going to start call these structures as thermal ridges and uh, just commit may be convenient. And, uh, and in this figure shows the temperature field, the vertical temperature field along this cross section A, A, A prime. And uh, like uh, 
horizontal axis is longitude along this longitude. Vertical axis is non-dimensional temperature. So non-dimensional temperature, when non-dimensional temperature equals one, that means the real temperature is about 2,500 K. So now you, you can see the lowest and hottest temperature in these regions, maybe there is about 700 degree difference between the lowest and the hottest. And the, or in, in other words, the thermal ridges, they are usually about several hundred, three to 400 degrees hotter than the surrounding background mantle. And the one really important finding I want to point out is that although thermal anomalies are widespread outside the thermal chemical pie, mantle plumes still form preferentially at the edges of the thermal chemical pile. This is a very important. And the next we we have we run, I'm going to show you other models with different parameters to try to understand what causes the these thermal ridges. And in this calculation, I remove the thermal chemical pile so it's purely thermal or isochemical. You can still see the uh, uh, linear like thermal ridges in 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 these cold subduction inflant regions, right? They are extending in the direction with mantle flow direction. However, if I use zero CMB heat flux, then no surprise, the common boundary just becomes, becomes really, really cold. And you don't see like hot thermal ridges that much. And uh, also I test models with lower really number or lower vehicle of convection. So with lower vehicle of convection, like materials just convection becomes much slower and also it allows longer time for these thermal ridges to grow. And they usually have a wider, uh, wider structure and also uh, the population, they are not that many, they are as, uh, they are less thermal ridges as well. And uh, one, one very important uh, feature of these models, like for example, in this model, is the structure of these cold dome rollings. So you may be really surprised or even criticize this model because these cold dome rollings never looks like subduct slabs. They, they are actually jitting like structures, right? And they are not wall like structure. And the, this is uh, particularly, uh, this is because we try to understand the situation when these gaps between uh, subduct slabs or these really stronger thermal Heterogeneities between the uh, subduct slabs, and the we and the next, I'm going to show you some models with wall-like structures. So to to provide wall-like subduct slabs, you need the one one way is to increase the viscosity of the cold subduct slabs. So to do that, we we can simply increase the uh, the temperature dependent of viscosity, like because subduct slabs are colder. So if if you increase the temperature dependent on viscosity, then the viscosity of subduct slab it becomes high, becomes higher. Then now you can see it becomes wall-like structure, right? And uh, so if you have wall-like structure and these two models, so like the figure on the uh, on the left shows a model when the temperature dependent on viscosity is increased only on in the upper mantle, and uh, the figure on the right shows the temperature dependent with cost is increased in the whole mantle. So like this, almost no difference between these two models. And the, the, main, the common thing is that we don't see that many thermal ridges inside these cold subducting regions, right? This, and uh, it indicates that, okay, so the structure of the subduct slabs may be important. And uh, this is, an, uh, this is another model. And in this model, we introduce post-pro sky phase transition and the post-pro sky is 500 times less viscous than the surrounding mantle. Now you can see in this model, although the subduct slabs, they are still have wall-like structure. You still see lots of uh, like linear thermal ridges in the low most, forming in the low most mantle and they are extending in the directions of mantle mental flow directions, right? So then our next question is trying to answer what mechanism causes these thermal ridges. And uh, to answer this question, I'm going to introduce you to lots 
to some uh, small box models. Like uh, the model domain of the small box models are showing in this orangey color, and uh, it's 40 by 40 degree in latitude and longitude, and also the thickness is uh, only 300 kilometer steps, and it has very really high resolution. And for these small box models, the boundary conditions are very, really, very really important. And that for these models, uh, for the top surface, I use the imposed velocity and as shown in this figure. And this imposed velocity is directly interpreted from the large box model. So it, it, this indicates that it's more reasonable instead of in, imposed some artificial uh, surface velocity. And the uh, CMB velocity is free slip and the side boundaries are uh, stress free. So that means material can freely go in and go outside of this model. And uh, also we need to be very careful about the surface temperature. Like I show you in this figure on the right, the surface temperature is also interpreted from the global uh, and from the large scale box models. And in this, in this slide, I show the result of one of the small box models. And the figure A shows the temperature field at 45 kilometers above common boundary. Now you can see lots of thermal ridges forming in the, also in this small box model, which is consistent with the large box models. And in figure B and figure C, we show the vertical cross section of temperature field in this in regions outside the, before the development of thermal ridges and the after development of thermal ridges. And these arrows in figure B and figure C show the work in the velocity field in the vertical domain. So now if you look at figure B, you can see like before the development of thermal ridges, thermal ridges all the mantle flow velocity, they just go upward, right? However, in figure C, after development of thermal ridges, you can see like small scale connection develops uh, in near the, like in the up, in the lowermost 100 kilometers of the model. So that, that indicates that, oh, they, these uh, thermal ridges are formed by small scale connection which has a uh, very, very similar to the sub lithosphere uh, small scale convection. And the next, I'm going to show you the importance of the thermal heterogeneities in slabs. So to, demo to demonstrate this state importance, I I'm going to show you three different models. So again, this figure shows the temperature field at uh, 300 kilometers above the CMB for small box models. And uh, this is the result, the temperature at 45 kilometer steps above the above common boundary. So now you, if you look at this figure, there are uh, tem temperature heterogeneities in these cold regions, in these relatively cold stone rolling regions, right? And uh, now you can see it causes thermal ridges. However, uh, next I'm, I modify then, I modify the temperature field on the top surface of the small small box model and the, the temperature contains two parts one part is in this region showing by gray color which also uh, homogeneous and the other part is this, this relative blue band which is relatively colder than the uh, the, the, uh, the other regions too and this cold band represents the homogeneous uh temp temp thermally homogeneous cold dome rolling so and let's see the result of this this model so now you can see if there's no thermal heterogeneities in the cold dome rollings, you just don't see uh, thermal heterogeneities in, the, in this region as well, right? It's, and also, however, really important finding is that although the cold dome rollings are thermally homogeneous, it still in ch triggers some uh, thermal anomalies, like but these thermal anomalies developed like later. Uh, relatively later and uh, in, this in these regions and they have a quite complex structure. Some are uh, parallel to the mantle flow velocity, some are perpendicular to the mantle flow velocity. And then uh, now I also make, make an, another artificial surface temperature. So I introduce some periodically 
periodic thermal anomalies inside the cold dome volumes. Now, if you look at the result, it shows the development of thermal ridges uh, as well, and also the locations of these thermal ridges are exactly the same as the locations of these uh, uh, thermal anomalies on the surface. So, and the, uh, in my opinion, these results clearly demonstrate that the, lo the thermal heterogeneities in subduct slabs can choose the locations of the uh, uh, thermal ridges, right? So in summary, we found that, uh, uh, not we, so in summary, previous seismic studies have shown low velocity structures outside the LSVPs in the lowmost mantle. And also previous studies have shown that hot anomalies form in regions with convergent mantle flows. And uh, what was new in this study is that like the sub sphere uh, small scale convection, we also found hot linear thermal anomalies uh, formed as a result of small scale convection in mantle flow directions from the base of uh, thermal boundary near the common boundary. And uh, we also found that the thermal anomalies in subducting slabs greatly promote, but they are actually not required for the formation of uh, thermal ridges. And the, our result indicates that the relatively cold subduction influence regions of the Earth's lowmost mantle may contain lots of localized hot anomalies. And these hot anomalies may not associate with upwelling mantle plumes, right? And the, our results also have very really important implications. Like for example, the thermal ridges may lead to variations of CMB heat flux and the CMB topography. They may also cause partial melting in the subduction inferior regions above the CMB. And also they, they may also cause or enhance seismic and anisotropy in these regions. And the mantle plumes developed from the thermal ridges, they may entrain material from the common boundary to shallow, uh, to shallow mantle. Now, I, I, I also want to uh, answer this, uh, have some discussion of this question. Then the question is really what causes thermal kilogenities in slabs? Like previously, I show you there are lots of gaps in subduct slabs, and the people uh, think that the gaps are caused by tearing. And uh, in this figure, I'm showing, I'm showing you the temperature field beneath the lithosphere at about 200 kilometer steps. And uh, I'm showing, now you can see similar to previous results, we also found the small scale convection developing into rectal rows beneath the lithosphere. And these rectal rows, they eventually join together uh, to a big dome whirling. And, the dome, and as a result, the Dome whirling also have a uh, thermal heterogeneity is being introduced to the lowmost mantle. And then eventually the heterogeneity in this dome whirling, they trigger the formation of thermal ridges. So we think that the thermal heterogeneity is in the uppermost mantle. And in the most lowmost mantle, they are actually can be connect, connected, right? And uh, uh, our models have lots of simplifications, right? And uh, uh, like currently, we are still working on these types of models. And the, the question we try to understand is, what, what if the slab have different morphology? Like, what if you have single-sided subduction, you, you include change migration, you have stagnant slabs or slab folding or in the lowmost mantle or slab detachment uh, at some depths. And this figure shows one of the most recent model I just finished yesterday. And uh, it has single-sided subduction and the slab is like wall-like structure. And uh, it sinks to the, it, the slab sinks to the lowmost mantle. It also uh, causes the parallel linear structure thermal ridges, right? And then another important question is, what, what if you introduce subduct oceanic crust to your model? And what the distribution of the subduct oceanic crust will be uh, if, if you include in, the, in these models and how they affect the formation of thermal ridges, right? So that's the end of my talk, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I'll applaud for everyone. Um, uh, very cool stuff. Uh, are there any questions for Ming Mei? Um, I have I have one question for Ming Mei. Sure. 
Uh, so uh, this is Jiaxin from Michigan State University. And uh, for your, in your small box model um, with a more, um, more homogeneous um, sided slab, well, probably in your page 46. Oh, 45, sorry. Yeah, so, so in, the, in the middle figure, Although we, we, although we don't see the, the linear, linear shaped ridge like a thermal structure, um, but still on the right side of your middle figure, we, we still can see some, um, some thin thermal anomalies and some network like structure. I'm wondering well, what's, the, what's, the, what's the cause of, um, of those anomalies? Is that just a random thing in your model or is it, um, are there any uh, particular causes that you think will lead to this kind of structure? Thanks, thanks Jiaxin. That's a re re really good question. Thanks for asking that loose question. So, and, uh, you, you, in our opinion, these structures, they are also caused by the small scale convection. So, uh, our point is that no matter whether there is thermal chlorogenity in, uh, in cold dome buildings or not, thermal uh, the small scale convection, they just, uh, uh, they just form as a result of thermal instability, like the sub sphere small convection. But uh, one important finding is that if you have thermal chlorogenities in subductive slabs, it just promotes the formation of these small scale convections. And uh, also, uh, you can see the structure are kind of a net-like structure, and uh, we, uh, we think that these net-like structure, they are actually maybe caused by the imposed surface velocity like near this button. And to also, to answer, to test this possibility, we actually perform other models. And uh, then we, we did not impose velocity on the top surface. We actually impose velocity on the command boundary. Then we also found that no matter, no matter, you have whether you have some heterogeneity in slabs or not, the thermal ridges all always form as a result of small scale convection. They just form at later time if the slab is homogeneous. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, there's some questions in the chat. Uh, Min Chen, would you like to ask your question? Uh, my question is, which parameters control the geometry of the thermal ridges? Because uh, the thermal ridges at the command boundary in your uh, simulation is about pretty much 200 kilometers across at the base with height of 100 kilometers. Then what can change this geometry? Yes, that's a really good question. The size of the thermal ridges, like the height, the width, they are can one of the major parameters is the Rayleigh number or the weaker O connection. Like the lower the Rayleigh number, uh, the larger the size, or in other words, the, the lower the viscosity, the small, uh, the more small scale connection develop, then the small size the thermal ridges will be. Yes, yeah, mainly controlled by the weaker O connection. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kent Condi, you have your hand raised. Would you like to ask your question? Uh, great talk, Ming Ming. Thank you. Um, a question I have is what determines whether you get mantle plumes developed from these slabs pushing to the side? I mean, most of these are just thermal anomalies. When would a mantle plume develop? What would determine that? Oh, that's a very, very good question. So if you, if you look at this, this figure, which is not, not that good, let's look at this movie actually at a later time. And uh, there are mantle plumes developing near the at edges of the thermal boundary, at edges of thermal chemical piles. So usually mantle plumes develop when the, thermal, when the thickness of the thermal ridges becomes very thick and eventually becomes unstable. So usually, and because the thickness of the thermal ridges increases uh, from the downwelling regions to towards the edges of thermal chemical pile, so usually mantle plume, the thermal ridges become thickest 
in near the edges of thermal chemical pile and then eventually it becomes unstable and just rise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vermeer, you have a question in the chat. Would you like to ask? Yes, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot change the name of my computer, so it's Anne <laughs> I wondered if it was Anne. Hi. <laughs> Would you like to ask yeah. a question? <laughs> so, um, yes, I, I was wondering about the wavelengths again. So, your thermal ridges uh, seems to have about a 200 kilometer wavelengths and so it would it would uh, I agree that uh, it would fit well with uh, uh, small scale uh, instabilities in the very low viscosity because uh, much hotter layer above the CMB but when you look at the tomographic models uh, like for example uh, the French and Romanovich one uh, they show spacing of low anomalies outside the LLSVPs that is uh, really bigger, more like the 800 to 1,000 kilometers. So um, do you think it's a different mechanism uh, of instabilities or is there a gathering of instabilities? Can you see this also in your models? Yes. Because in the lab, we would predict the 100 kilometer uh, size, I mean spacing, that's what we see in the lab, but, uh, but in your modeling, do you see this as well? Yes, that's, that's a re really important question about the size or the wavelength of this thermal region. So as I said before, the thermal the wavelength is mainly controlled by the viscosity. And also, and uh, also another thing I want to point out, like the seismic tomography models, uh, they, the resolution may still not as perfect. So the size may be even uh, over overestimated. And also another point I want to uh, bring, bring here is that like this study particularly focus on the development of thermal ridges as a first mechanism for small scale convection. But actually this is not this is not the only way. And previously people have done lots of studies. They found that mantle plumes or thermal anomalies they can develop just when the when to in convergent mantle flow regions, like uh, when two slabs uh, merge together in the common boundary, they, they can just push uh, a hot anomalies between these two slabs. And also, uh, one thing I also want to point out, which is also simplification in our model, in our current models, which is that the subduct slab, they does not move. They are almost fixed in outside boundaries, but in reality, the, in the true earth, the slab can migrate and uh, can fold it. And all of these complexities can contribute to the shape and contribute to the size of these uh, hot thermal anomalies. And this is really, I think this is really important question. And, uh, and uh, this is our goal, our current goal to understand how these uh, complexities contribute to the size and also contribute to the shape of these uh, thermal anomalies. Yeah, that, that's uh, the direction that we are approaching right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, there's another question in the chat uh, from Yi Chen. Um, there are uh, about uh, heterogeneities uh, within the LLSVP. And so do you think yes. it's the same mechanism for them as it is for outside the LLSVP? Oh uh, yeah, that, that's that's very true. I, I think maybe the same mechanism like small scale convection can also develop within the LSVPs. In my opinion, there's no reason to to avoid there is no reason to say no, this cannot happen. And the, because this small scale convection is just a fundamental physics process. So in my opinion, it should occur within the LSVPs as well. Let me see if I have any figures. Well, this is one of the model I did before, and it does show lots of structures within the two large low geography provinces. I did not show this in my talk, but just for backup. <laughs> 
Thank okay. you for the question. Uh, uh, and uh, Xi Zhang, would you like to ask your question? Well, actually, I no, actually, I don't have a question. I was just uh, making a comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> I see. Uh, good talk, Mimi. Yeah. Thank you, Xi. Um, oh, okay. Uh, uh, Yichen has a follow-up. Thank you. And um, do you think the formation of the thermal ridges is periodic and associated with the cycles of supercontinent evolution? Ah, uh, I never thought about this before. That, that's very interesting. So in, ten, in terms of space, it's periodic. But in terms of time, I guess so. I, I, ne I never thought about this, yeah. That's very interesting. Oh, uh, yeah, Min Chen, would you like to ask? Yes. I have an additional question because Mimi uh, stated that viscosity would be the key factor that controls the geometry of the thermal ridges, right? Yes. Okay, good. And then, so what we saw in tomographic image will have some indication of the, uh, the range of the value of the viscosity. Uh, that, that's, that's a very good question. I think maybe, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, tomography models, first, first of all, we need to be, there's no perfect tomography models, right? The size is very difficult to be constrained in tomography models. And also in our geodyne modeling models, uh, viscosity is really important, but this is not the only parameter that affects the size. As I said before, the subduction history may also uh, if affect the size of the thermal ridges, right? And also, particularly, also the command boundary heat flow, they also, they are also actually affect the development of these thermal ridges as well. So uh, I think that that's a really interesting question, maybe a direction that we can push uh, in, the, in the future. But currently, I, I, I will not just guess or I will not estimate with low most mantle viscosity simply based on comparing our models with seismic tomography models. Yeah. Okay, so that is because the current model is not high resolution enough. However, oh, no, the, the the, yeah, the resolution of oh, the seismic resolution is maybe still have room for improvement. And also the geodyne modeling, the resolution I think is enough for geodyne modeling, but it just, we haven't explored all the complexities in uh, geodyne modeling yet. So it's, Early, too earlier to make that connection, in my opinion. So what about forward modeling? Because uh, you can come up with a model that is uh, reasonable with all this reasonable choice of parameters. Then can we use seismological method to testify, test it? Yes, I, I agree. For forward modeling, you can surely uh, test different size models. Then you can maybe can constrain the size, the, later extent and also the height of these structures. That, that part I agree. And uh, for, I, I mentioned several modeling, uh, four modeling studies before and uh, by, by recent, recently, and uh, they, the size is about several hundred in later extent and also in, in height. And this is quite comparable, maybe may coincidentally quite comparable to the size of these thermal ridges. So I, I, I'm not sure whether it's just coincidence, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, Kent Kandi, did you have another question? Yeah, I did. It was a follow-up question on the periodicity. Uh, Ming Ming, is there some way you can build periodicity into your models and test for periodicity? Uh, I I think so. So like for these models, because the model are free, I mean, I do not impose anything. So they free develop. So maybe uh, the periodicity is not that clear, but perhaps one way is to examine the periodicity is, is to 
introduce periodic subduction to this model and then examine the formations of monoplumes uh, to look whether it's periodic or not. And, uh, and also, in my opinion, these three D models is a way better than two D models in terms of study the periodicity because in two D models it uh, it just can really really constrained the convection domain, but in three D models, it model clones have more freedom to develop. Is to my in my opinion, is more a way more realistic than uh, compared to the true Earth. Yes. Uh, the answer is yes, we can do that. And uh, I think that that is very, 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 very good, really, very good direction that we can go. Like I showed you in this figure, we actually impose a velocity on the top surface. And uh, then following on your question, what if we modify the velocity periodically? Do we see uh, periodic formations of thermal ridges or minor plumes or not? That, that is really interesting to study. Yes. Yes, it would be. I think those results would be very interesting, especially to see if they could tie in with, you know, periodicity in the zircon age record. We've talked about this before, you and I have. Uh, right, right. We, we previously talked about this before, and uh, we, we have been thinking about doing 3D uh, calculations. On, on on this part and this is still go still outgoing ongoing works. We're still testing different models uh, for for this. Thanks thanks for pointing this out. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Well, I'm going to ask one before we go. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, looking at some of your figures uh, where you zoomed into the lowermost mantle, are all the ridges forming about the same distance from the edge of the slab? Um, or do any yeah, or, or, Almost, yeah, oh. almost from the same distance, right? Yeah. And that's, yeah, but not all thermal ridges, they actually have perfect linear structure. They can be torted due to the changes of the surrounding mantle flow. Yeah. Okay, uh, and then a uh, final follow-up then, have you compared any of these results um, with tomography um, sort of specifically in any one region? Yes, we, we did, we did compare the size. We also did a really simple estimation, like what if you have the thermologist is this hot how much seismic anomaly reduction you you can contribute is quite quite consistent and uh, I did not uh, show figures here but in the paper and uh, we have a very long discussion on it but in my opinion it's still too early to make a direct comparison between these two yeah it's okay. not not safe. <laughs> uh Thank you very much. Uh, if there are no other questions, then let's all thank um, Ming Ming again. It was a great talk. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Kili. <laughs>